I, I have it. <laughs> All right, can you hear me? Oh, yes, oh, you sure can. Um, so good evening and welcome. We are very excited today to have um, Emily Kirchner Morris with us. Um, we have about 70 people online, as well as the group that we have here in the audience. We have a topic that oftentimes gets left out. Somehow we think, okay, you know, we got them through elementary school, we're good. And then middle school and high school hits, and we're not good anymore. So we are very excited to be able to listen and learn um, how to support our learners um, in what can be sometimes a difficult age, um, compounded by the fact that I'm gifted or I'm twice exceptional. So you're not here to hear me, um, but we are very excited to have Emily with us. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, awesome. So, um, yeah, welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Um, it was, um, apparently there's a golf thing happening this week. I don't really know, but there were lots of people on the plane um, with golf clubs. And so I actually live in St. Louis, but um, I enjoy my time coming down here and, and working with the teachers and talking to the parents. So I'm really excited to, to talk to you about this topic. Sorry, I've got a... I'm going to be messing with this now for the entire time. I can just tell. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk today, though, about gifted and twice exceptional tweens and teens. So yeah, those middle school age um, all the way up through high school um, and even a little bit beyond that. They all kind of fall into this category. And it is easy to forget that there are some unique developmental needs that they really do have and that many of their developmental needs really are similar to other students, but we have to look at them through the lens of giftedness. So we're going to consider all of those things. Just a little bit about me. So um, I am the host of the Neurodiversity Podcast. I am the parent of three kids. I have a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old and an eight-year-old. So very much in that teen and tween world there. Prior to being in, um, you know, I, I currently actually work as a mental health counselor. Prior to that, I worked as an educator. I taught in gifted ed programs. Um, and so all of that has kind of led me to start the Neurodiversity Podcast. Um, these are three books that I have written. Um, and if you haven't checked out the podcast yet, I would highly encourage you to do so. We have a ton of great episodes about all different things from transitioning to college, um, to just, um, you know, supporting twice exceptional kids, to understanding giftedness, whatever that might be. And we really try to pull and integrate information for parents and educators and clinicians into those episodes. So I'm going to um, do a drawing. I have one copy of Raising Twice Exceptional Children and one copy of A Parent's Guide to Gifted Children that we will do. So you can use this QR code. Um, hopefully those of you who are also online can use the QR code that's showing up on the slide that you have there. And um, if you register, we will do that drawing at the very end of the presentation. Um, so hopefully um, it'll be an opportunity for you to get, if you're not here tonight, if you're online, we'll get it to you. We'll figure out, we'll figure out how to get the, you the copy if you win. So um, it, it, it really is, I think, a unique age. So let me just, I want to kind of start off just by kind of defining a few terms for everybody, just so we're all on the same page. So um, giftedness, obviously, we know is identified through the schools. Students typically are um, placed either in some of those cluster group classrooms or they're in some of those other programs that you guys have where they're kind of self-contained. Um, twice exceptional is a term that refers to kids who are both gifted and have another diagnosis. So autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dysgraphia, any of these other types of um, neurodivergent labels that kind of get layered on top of that giftedness. And it makes it often very difficult to kind of tease out what's giftedness, what's this other diagnosis, and what's really going on and how we can support them. Um, just in general, um, I think that there is a lot of 
misunderstanding that goes into any of those labels, especially when we talk about self-understanding. So we'll talk about that tonight, about how important it is for kids to really learn to understand their brains and themselves in order to um, live successful and fulfilling lives. So I'm going to kind of break this down into three different areas that we will talk through today. And when we think about this, this really is about how those kids have these, these various areas of their lives that kind of all intersect. And this, this age of, of being a tween all the way through, you know, graduating from high school and starting college or whatever that next step is, is really interesting because um, there's, there's both this, it, it's just a stage of really um, identity formation, right? Where they're really figuring out who they are. They want some independence. Um, they're pushing, you know, for, for some of those, um, you know, privileges that come along with being older. So the, th oh, that was the wrong button. So the things that we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about their academic lives and how that really impacts their identity development. We're going to talk about their social lives and how those impact their development. And then finally, we're gonna talk about their emotional lives and specifically, we're going to talk about mental health and self-regulation and ultimately culminate all of this with how we can support and build resilience in our kids. So let's start off with academic lives and expectations. There are a lot of things that kind of influence kids that we can really think about, about how they need some support for their academic lives. So one thing to consider is like, what are their expectations for themselves? We know that kids have um, internalized a lot of messages from the time that they were very young. So for example, they might have internalized the message that they're smart and therefore things are supposed to be easy. But the hard part about that is, especially for younger kids, things generally, you know, if they're gifted, they are often easy, but as they grow up, they progressively get more difficult. And so sometimes eventually they hit a wall where that ability just isn't always catching up to all of that. And so that can cause a lot of, um, Frustration, especially if there's been some perfectionism that's developed when they were a little bit younger. Um, other expectations for themselves, though, you know, if they are a child who maybe is twice exceptional and they've learned the message that they're lazy or they're unmotivated, right, that ha influences how they see themselves and what their expectation is. But we know that there can be a lot of pressure there. There's also the expectations of others, what are their expectations of their parents, of their teachers, of society? What does it mean for them to be a gifted or twice exceptional student? Um, and so all of these different things, you know, kind of influence how they see themselves and how they um, interact with the world around them. And so we know that a lot of kids really need some support in balancing those academic lives and their extracurriculars. So one of the things that you will frequently see with, um, with, with bright kids is that they can do a lot of things. And sometimes they want to do a lot of things, um, depending on what their personalities are. But it can be this pressure to take the advanced level courses and the pre-AP and the AP courses when they get into high school. And we really have to ask some important questions about that to make sure that the choices that they're making really are setting them up for success. I always say that just because a kid can take all of the AP classes doesn't mean that they should, right? Um, there really should be a prioritization there. And my thought always is, is it important to be challenged? Yes. Is it important to push yourself a little bit to see what that challenge is like, to see if you can do it? Yeah. But if you have to choose between taking four core AP classes you know, and something else, and then dropping an extracurricular activity because you don't have time to do it, that's probably, you know, not, not a great balance there. Part of the reason for some of this overcommitment that we see with, um, with gifted kids is the fact that they, they have what we call multi-potentiality, meaning that they have the ability to do many things well. Now, there are some kids who have very specific and narrow areas of interest and performance, and that's great. And they should pursue those things with all the vigor that they, they can muster. But we also know that for a lot of gifted kids, they could do a lot of different things well. 
And that causes a lot of pressure with some of those choices that they have to make. So I have a clip from the podcast from Dr. John Goodwin. He is um, a psychologist. He lives in California. And he talks and researches about multipotentiality. And so he's going to share some of his thoughts about what that is and how it impacts kids. Multipotentiality is often thought of, and I think a good working definition, um, or individuals who are multipotential are those individuals who have diverse talents and interests and they can succeed at a very high level in a number of different fields, okay? Oftentimes, these fields might be quite divergent. Right. The potential aspect typically refers to something maybe latent or even uncertain, but it can be developed and it's indicative of capacity. And a major question for students who are impacted by multipotentiality is how do I make a career decision and how can I choose a path from so many realistic possibilities? And so it's really important to think about with our multipotential students, there's an important distinction between some of the, the career choice dilemmas that that most pre-collegiate students may experience, or even students who are in college, I think that it can be difficult for anyone to uh, explore or commit to a particular career path, right? However, for many students who are not multipotential, they typically, certainly by the time they get to uh, prepare for college, they've kind of circumscribed their career choice options to a relatively limited array of options. With our high ability students who are impacted by multipotentiality, they may have multiple highly divergent career paths that they could pursue and be successful at a very high level. So while he is talking specifically about that transition into college and making some of those career choices, this impacts kids even from a very young age. What electives should I take? What extracurricular should I do? I can do this and do it really well and I wanna do it, but does it mean I have to give up this other thing? You know, as I go into a career field, if I choose you know, that I want to go into the medical field, well, that means I can't pursue music you know, and, and, and so that can cause a lot of problems. And when you layer that with any sort of perfectionism, it can be really scary to let go of some of those options and to let go of some of those choices. Um, so that might be something that, that kids might really face um, that we can consider, again, as part of that identity development as they are growing older. So we can also talk about when we talk about those exceptionalities, talking specifically about twice exceptional learners, we can recognize that some of these kids may have been identified or diagnosed when they were young, but not all of them have been. Um, a lot of times as they get older, some of these things come to the surface because giftedness really can mask the characteristics that come along with ADHD or with autism or dyslexia. And so if the giftedness was noticed first, um, or sometimes even if the giftedness wasn't noticed, but but it kind of balanced out those areas of difficulty, maybe they weren't even identified. Um, in the DSM for autism, there's actually a statement in there that talks about how some of the social communication differences that we see in autistic individuals don't really manifest until the expectations outpace their abilities. So what that means is that if you've got a really bright kid who's autistic, Again, they may, those things may not really come to the surface until all of a sudden in that, those tween years or in those teen years where those social differences really um, and social expectations really elevate, that's when those things, we might really notice them and identify them. One really interesting fact is that um, research shows that of individuals who are identified as autistic, they are one and a half times more likely than the general population to also be gifted. So when we talk about like a gifted ed classroom versus a general ed classroom, we're gonna have more autistic students who are gifted and autistic in here. So you might see some of those things coming to the surface a little more frequently. 
but how does that impact how they see themselves? How does that impact what they know about themselves? Um, you know, I'm really a strong proponent of the idea that labels, while I wish that they weren't necessary, ultimately I feel like they're a good thing. Like I wish we lived in a utopian society where we didn't need labels and everybody just got what they needed based on what those needs were, but we're not there right now. And so we need these labels, but part of the importance of labels for neurodivergent people is if you don't have an accurate label, that label gets filled in with other things, right? You know, instead of like, oh, I'm, I'm ADHD, um, you know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm lazy, I'm unorganized, I'm, you know, I don't care about school, I'm unmotivated. Or if I don't have the label of gifted, it's like, I don't know, everyone thinks I'm weird, I'm overbearing, I don't know, whatever, whatever those labels might be that go along with that. Um, and sometimes it's just easier to have that label and to talk about it openly. What are the strengths that come along with it, along with the struggles? Because there's no label like that that doesn't have a little bit of that balance both ways. We really want to lean into kids' strengths, and that's part of the you know, um, idea behind the multipotentiality is that they have many strengths that you can lean into. But for 2E kids, what we often focus on is on fixing the areas of difficulty for them. However, that's really not um, the most effective way to support them. So when we know that somebody has a real strength in creative writing or with visual spatial ability in art or creativity or whatever those might be, the more we can pull them in to support them, the better. So for example, if you have a student of any age who's struggling with executive functioning, it's better to work on building those executive functioning skills within an area of strength as opposed to an area of weakness. So if they're really struggling with math and being organized in a math classroom, don't try to build their executive functioning skills related to math, build their executive functioning skills related to something that they love, and then you can kind of transition and generalize it over to that other area. We also just wanna advocate for accommodations, and this can sometimes be hard, again, because when you have that gifted piece, sometimes um, educators don't always understand what they need. It's like, well, they're, so, they're supposedly so smart. Why can't they do X, Y, and Z? But accommodations, for example, like extended time um, are really important because, you know, there might be kids who need that extended time, for example, on standardized tests like the SAT or ACT so that they can show their full ability. I will also just mention real briefly, um, and this is important really for tweens and teens, a lot of times there are kids who can do okay without that extended time, but they would actually show their full ability if they, if they did have that, and that might be a struggle for them. Or they might be in a situation where the teachers kind of just allow them to have the extra time without having any formal accommodation. The problem with that is if, you, if your student is one who really needs that extra time, um, if it's not documented somewhere that they are using that as an accommodation, they won't qualify for it when they, when they take the ACT because you have to provide that documentation. So if you know that, that your child has been using extra time, that the teachers are giving it to them or whatever, and it's not formalized, you might wanna talk to them about that because having a paper trail is really important so that you can support the need for that because otherwise there's no, you know, um, they're not super flexible with that. So let's talk a little bit about social lives and family and peer relationships and how that really impacts our gifted and twice exceptional tweens and teens. So some of the things that can influence feelings of loneliness and isolation, which is a, which is a concern for some of our gifted and um, 2E kids, are first of all, asynchrony and cognitive complexity, which cognitive complexity is really a, a, an example of asynchrony. So asynchrony is a term that refers to the out of sync development that gifted individuals or 2E kids have, meaning that their cognitive skills in this area may be really high, but their social skills may be like at, at their typical age level. Um, or they, so they might have this vocabulary that's way up here, or they might be able to process information that's really above their same age peers, but because of that asynchrony, it's harder to connect, right? So even though their social skills may be 
about the same as what those other kids are around them. If they talk like they're much older and the other kids don't always connect with that, that can be a, a barrier and cause them to feel like they don't have any peers who really understand them. They just also sometimes have different friendship patterns and that might just mean simply that they really um, seek out like just one really you know, intense friendship and that fulfills their, their social needs or, um, or they might be okay with just having a, you know, a handful of people but even just more of a surface level friendship, whatever those might be um, and that can be okay for them as well. But we know that that can influence those things. Frequently though what I see is that kids just really want at least one person who gets them, right? And what we need to remember is that even in those tween and teen years, that those, those kids who are at the exact same age level might not be the best fit for that, right? They might not connect quite as well. So one of the nice things, especially about high school, is that if you get involved in some extracurricular activities or even in the classes, you're not as bound by age norms because of those um, age bands within, within each age level or grade level. So you can kind of find some people who are maybe a little bit older or even a little bit younger, but who have similar interests that you can connect with. Um, some, some common coping strategies that kids use in order to kind of figure out this whole social thing so first of all, sometimes they deny their talent, right? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not really good at that. I don't want anybody to know that. I have a friend who I went to school with from, uh, yeah, kindergarten all the way through senior year of high school. He was in the gifted ed class with, with me. And um, we ran into each other like in, when we were in college and we were talking one time and he was telling me he was a competitive pianist he used to go and do all these things, and he never told anybody, even the people in our small gifted ed class, and we were all really pretty close, because he didn't want to be different in that way. And it was like, I mean, he, and, and it's like basically, and then he, he had shown me, um, you know, I mean, it was just amazing that he, the, how, the level at which he could play, and the fact that he never told anybody because he wanted to fit in. He didn't want to be different. Minimizing achievement is similar to this, but more than anything, when I think about minimizing achievement, I'm thinking more about like the academic piece of it, right? I don't wanna take that AP class, I just wanna be in the gen ed class so that my friends are there. Or especially for tweens and especially for tween girls, it's like, it's not so cool to be smart. And so I wanna downplay that so that I can develop these friendships. And then also just conforming with others. You know, I'm going to mimic this. I'm going to, going to put on this mask so that I fit in. And the problem with all of these things are, it's, it's like, that, that doesn't feel good, right? And sometimes kids aren't even really aware that they're doing it, but we want to talk to them about those things because it just really can um, wear away at their overall um, self-esteem and self-worth if they're constantly trying to keep themselves small and fit into the box where they think other people will like them. So one thing that's really interesting about peer relationships is that we, we often think about how, especially tweens and teens, are more influenced by their peers than they are by their family. And there is some research that shows that, but specifically, the ages of 12 to 14 are the ages when kids are most highly influenced by their peers. They're the most aware of how they're perceived. They're most aware of like what all those dynamics are. And this makes total sense. My daughter's in eighth grade. I work with my clients at the office, my, you know, who are my, for counseling. And I always tell them middle school is the worst for social stuff. Seventh grade seems to be the peak. And then it's kind of like, it gets worse starting in like fourth, fifth grade, it starts to kind of get bad. And then seventh grade is the worst. And then it kind of starts to get better and kind of tapers down. But that really is the age where there's the highest influence from peers. Um, kids this age have the highest level of importance of feeling like they fit in and they wanna avoid being left out. Um, and they're more likely to seek the rewards of being liked by, by friends. So as parents, this is the age where we really wanna be aware of what kids are um, doing as they're socializing, who are their friends, Luckily at this age, we probably have a little more influence than we do when they get a little bit older, especially once they are driving or their friends are driving. Um, 
but but the but the thing is is like really um, the research also shows that kids really gravitate towards um, peers who who are compassionate, right? Like and, and um, that tip tends to be who people want to be friends with. So the fear that kids are always going to be influenced negatively by their peers really is not necessarily true. Um, kids are just as likely to be influenced positively by their peers. So we just want to try to keep them with those friend groups as much as we can. Another piece about this with um, the, you know, talking about the, the family relationships. What are some of the things that we can do to really foster a solid parent and teen connection? So first of all, we really just want to have as much open communication as possible. Now, my 15-year-old rarely leaves his room, so there's not a whole lot of time for open communication. But when he is around, we do, <laughs> we do try to talk. But in general, though, I just try to, like, try to encourage him when we can. So one of the times that he will really open up, he's 15, he's got his driver's permit, he wants to learn to drive. Um, and so I can get him to get into the car with me. And you know, having those car conversations is great because usually it's just the two of us in the car, but also we're sitting side by side. We're not fit face to face. That makes it a little bit, bit easier to talk about things that might be uncomfortable. Um, but we really wanna foster that, um, that open communication. We also really want to help kids um, have a sense of independence because if they don't have that, they're going to push back. So um, this is this is a hard one, like that gradual release that we have to have as parents towards that independence. And depending on your child's personality, they may be like ready for it and going ahead of you, or they may be really struggling and have a hard time with this. Um, but ultimately, the more that we can really have them um, you know, make more of those choices for themselves and um, have some influence over the, the, the policies that we have in our house, the better that it is because, um, you know, they just really are going to want some of that. Um, the other thing about peer relationships at this age, it's more of a generational thing. It's really hard to understand that kids really do have friendships that are super fulfilling that are online. The nice thing about this for neurodivergent kids is it's often much easier for them to find friends online who have similar interests. Um, and so my daughter's like super into um, Pokemon and Wings of Fire, if you know that series of books, and um, like all of these kind of like unique little pockets of people, but it's sometimes hard to find people. But she's found people online through Roblox of all places. Um, and my husband sometimes gives her trouble. He's like, well, those are not real friends. And I'm like, well, what do you consider a real friend, right? How do you know, like, if that's somebody that they connect with, that they interact with on a regular basis, that they enjoy that time with them? Um, we need to sometimes reframe some of that. And you might be afraid that your child's like a loner, like they're only hanging out by themselves, but they may have some really solid friends online. I have some of those kids who are, who are clients who are like late bloomers with the social stuff. Um, maybe they have social anxiety. Maybe they just don't have a lot of skills at developing those relationships. But eventually, like having those relationships um, online is actually a really safe place for them to kind of explore that and find those people that they connect with. So we don't want to diminish that. We want to recognize that as a really valuable form of, of um, friendship. So we can't talk about tween and teen development without talking about social media. So first of all, 95% of young people ages 13 to 17 report using a social media platform. I'm surprised that it's only 95%. You know, most of them have, have multiple. Um, and more than a third of them say that they use social media almost constantly. Almost constantly. So what are some of the reasons or the themes of this social media use? Sometimes it's self-expression or validation. Sometimes it's um, appearance comparison and body ideals. It's a, there's a pressure to stay connected and that fear of missing out. Um, there is social engagement and peer support, which can be really positive, but there's also exposure to bullying and harmful content. 
I, I, I'll be honest, I don't know what the great solution is for the social media thing. It's, it's tough. You know, it's like I try to help balance my kids' social media consumption. I try to, I, you know, it's like I, we have a deal where it's like if, we're, if you're on a social media site, I'm on that site too and we're friends. And every once in a while, I'm like, hey, let's just go ahead and scroll through. Um, I even told my 15-year-old, I went through his TikTok and I went through and I... <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to mess with your algorithm a little bit here, okay? And so I went through and searched some people and <laughs> was looking at some things. I'm like, those influences will now be in his feed a little bit. And he knows, and we kind of joke about it. But, but hopefully, though, we can have, again, that open communication about this. It's like, you have the privilege of using this, but also we need to help moderate that content just a little bit. Um, but it's also not useful to just, you know, not have it just because it might be unsafe. So this next little clip is another clip from the podcast. It's from um, Deborah Heitner, and she's the author of several different books. Um, one of them is called Growing Up in Public. That's her most recent book. I know another topic that parents really consider, or hopefully are, are really starting to consider, I think when, when social media really came around originally, we just didn't really think about it a whole lot, but the fact that what we put online of our kids or what they put online of themselves is out there for public consumption. And it could be really difficult, if not impossible, to get that privacy back once it's out there. How do you help parents and kids navigating those situations? Yeah, I mean, a huge thing we can do is ask our kids permission before we post about them. And that sets them up to realize, hey, this is a boundary and I should be doing this when I post. I should be asking permission. I shouldn't just be posting. And it re reinforces that it's okay to have a boundary, which is a really positive thing. And it also gets kids asking the right questions like, dad, who's on your Instagram? Moms, who's on your Facebook, right? And getting them thinking a little bit about what the implications are of social media. Um, another thing we can do is make sure that they do understand that things are searchable, but we want to really focus on character over like consequences. Like we don't want to tell a sixth grader, you know, oh, you're not going to get into a fancy college because of what you just posted. We want to keep any sort of talk about reputation kind of to the moment. And we want to focus on not being misunderstood is the language that I prefer. And I think that's more positive. So instead of saying to a kid, like, you're not going to get into Princeton if you post that in sixth grade. I would say, does what you posted reflect the kind of friend you want to be and the friend you want people to see you as and who you are, right? And really focus on character and not just the threat of consequences. If you do want to go to consequences, which I think is realistic, like say they're posting at school, I would talk about now consequences like, hey, if you're in seventh grade and you're posting a bunch of really nasty language in a group text, somebody's mom or dad might see that and you might not get invited to that birthday party or bar mitzvah or whatever. Like they're going to have a judgment about you and they might think thoughts about you that might not feel accurate to you, but like you might be just kind of showing off for your friends, but you have to recognize that there might be this other audience there that you're not thinking about. And I think that's a more positive and helpful and also developmentally appropriate way because the fact is colleges will not see what you posted in elementary school or middle school. And even if you post something in high school, it would have to be extremely egregious. Like, yes, if you become known for having, you know, a white supremacist or homophobic YouTube channel or something like, yeah, there are going to be a lot of colleges. They're like, we don't want that kid on our campus. That person's a hater. Um, but if you're just using bad language or wearing clothes that your parents think are too sexy um, on Instagram, like, that's not going to keep you out of college. I live near Northwestern University and I can guarantee that many kids walking around that school, which is a very hard to get into college, have probably posted language that their parents wouldn't like or worn an outfit that their parents didn't love or, you know, something like that on social media or liked even liked a post that maybe they shouldn't have. And, and so it's I would think more about the consequences of how people who actually know you are going to understand or misunderstand you versus like you know, oh, these selective colleges are going to like go deep into your digital footprint and try to find your Instagram handle, even if it's not your name or whatever, they're not. So I, I like what she's talking about, about really kind of, kind of helping put all that into perspective about what kids are posting, what they're putting out there and what the impact is, um, you know, on a real day to day basis for them. So I want to talk a little bit about the emotional lives and mental health. And, and it's really hard to talk about mental health with tweens and teens without talking about some really sensitive topics. Um, and so we are going to kind of touch on some of those pieces because I think it's really important that parents know about what to look for, especially, and I'm talking specifically about like suicidality and self-injury. 
So um, before we get to that piece, just recognizing that high cognitive ability is not inherently linked to psychological problems. I think that that's kind of a myth that's out there, but there really is no research that shows that. But what we can consider is that there are environmental factors that can influence this, right? So again, if you're a student who's gifted and you're taking all of these high pressure AP courses, right? Or I have some students who, um, or some clients who attended a school and literally the school, it was a private school in St. Louis, and the school counselor described it to me as a pressure cooker. <laughs> And it's like, you know, we put these kids in these situations. And so those are things that can influence it that, but that's not inherently linked to their ability. That's linked to the environment. And so how do we modify the environment to support them? Um, and so when we, when we talk about the mental health concerns, we have to think about them within the context of that cognitive ability. How do we really support them in a way um, that honors their ability and, and takes it into um, account? So, you know, finding, if you end up do seeking out therapy or a counselor, um, if you can find somebody who understands and knows giftedness, great. If you can't, understandable, but maybe there's at least somebody who's willing to learn, right? So we'll start off by talking about NSSIB, which is non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. And what's interesting about this is this does not indicate that somebody wishes to die. Right? So we're talking about cutting, biting, scratching, these types of things. And there are many reasons why somebody engages in them, but they, it does not necessarily indicate suicidal intent. As a matter of fact, actually, it, it rarely does. Um, some of the reasons why people self-injure um, could be because they feel numb and they just want to feel something. Sometimes it's to punish themselves for making a mistake. Sometimes it's to distract from other emotional pain. Sometimes it's to have like an outward manifestation of that pain, meaning like I feel this so much internally and I can't really explain why. And so now I need to have like, like I need some tangible thing that shows this, right? Sometimes it's just to experience the sensation, right? It's like a sensory need. Um, and there are, there are others as well. But one of the things that we can do when we're having some of these difficult talks with kids is to normalize the fact that it is something that many people do once in a while, and we need to work, make sure that we're not instilling a sense of shame about it. So. It is a coping skill for whatever it is that they're dealing with. It's a maladaptive coping skill. It's not a coping skill that we want them to use. But when we frame it that way, that can help to like take some of the pressure off. It's not like you're doing something bad. You shouldn't be doing this. It's like, oh, you're doing this for a reason. Let's see if we can find a better way to cope with this rather than, rather than self-injury. So if you're talking to a child about this, try to figure out what, is, what purpose is it fulfilling? And then is there something else that might fulfill that need? So I have one client who um, <laughs> their, their replacement for self-injuring is holding planks. They get down and do planks and they hold it and, because they just need that like some sort of sensory input that's kind of, you know, hurts. It kind of distracts them from the other things that they're going through. Um, sometimes they're, they're like, there's some really odd things that people suggest. So like, I've heard of people talking about like breaking a raw egg over your arm. If, if you're someone who cuts, I've never had clients do that. I think that's kind of gross and messy, <laughs> but, um, but I think in general, it's like, if, if there's something else you could do, um, that could be good is, is snapping a rubber band on your wrist better than using a, a paper clip to cut your skin? Sure. I mean, I guess that's a step in the right direction, but ultimately we want to have healthy coping skills to help deal with this. And so we want to normalize the purpose, although not the behavior. Yeah, I understand you were really mad at yourself about that thing. I can understand why you felt like you wanted to punish yourself, even though maybe that's not really what you deserved. And, and I think maybe that was an out of, out of proportion thought, right? You know, I can, we can normalize what's going through their head 
but then try to try to move away from what they're doing as far as the the um, self injury goes. So we don't want to hyper focus on the on the self injury. We want to direct attention to the trigger, or the cause. I would of course recommend if if you do find out that your child is self injuring, that really is a time to kind of reach out to a professional to kind of help monitor that and and build some skills surrounding that. Um, but in general, though, like. I've had parents who've insisted on like checking their child's arms and stuff. Um, I don't really recommend that simply because ultimately you're going to like that just instills shame, like it's something bad. And additionally, like, okay, well, there there are other things that they could cut or do that would that they wouldn't necessarily show you. So it doesn't always solve the problem. You know, it's like you could take away whatever the instrument is that they're using to self-injure, they can just find another. So that doesn't really solve the problem, I guess is what my point is. So we want to kind of just not focus on that, focus on the trigger of the cause and work through those pieces. The other part is about suicidal thinking. So we want to normalize the fact that most people at some time in their life have thoughts about death, dying, or suicide. Like, like a death and dying in relation to suicide. Like, I wish I was dead, right? I wish I could go to sleep and never wake up. Suicidal ideation, is there's a spectrum of it all the way from passive ideation all the way to active, you know, attempts. And so, but, but kids don't know this. Kids have never been through it. Part of the reason why I think young people um, have such a hard time with so many things and why their feelings are so intense is because they've never experienced something. So the first time they have a breakup of a romantic relationship, somebody that they really loved, they've never had the experience of getting through it before and then looking back and go, man, that really sucked, but I got through it, right? And so when they have any of these thoughts, about suicidal ideation and they've never really experienced that before, they don't know if it's gonna last. They don't know if there's an end to that. And so we can talk about the fact that, yeah, lots of people do this. Like they think about it, they don't act on it, right? What do you do when you have the thought? How do you move away from that thought? And so some of the questions that you wanna ask, if you're just trying to do a really preliminary um, suicide assessment, as you're just sitting there talking, ask, ask your kiddo these three questions. Are you thinking about death or dying or hurting yourself? Are you having those thoughts? You know, and you could elaborate on that. Like, well, so what are those thoughts like? Like, what are, what are those thoughts, you know, what are you saying in your head when you have those thoughts? Have you thought about how you would hurt yourself? And do you think you're going to act on those thoughts? So right there, we're asking about ideation, plan, and intent. It's really scary to have those conversations, but my goodness, it's important. I mean, I'll be honest, my 15-year-olds, I mean, if you've had a 15-year-old, you know what I'm talking about, but um, he and my husband got in an argument the other day, and, and it was like a bigger deal than what it needed to be, but he doesn't really get upset about stuff, and he was pretty upset, and so I went in, and I just checked with him, I just asked, are you having any thoughts about hurting yourself? Because part of it was he was like banging on the wall because he was mad, luckily he didn't break, break himself or the house, but you know, we just need to be aware of those things. So how do we move through all those things? So resilience is the antidote for shame, anxiety, and low self-confidence. So how do we build resilience in our kids? How do we help them understand who they are and really build that um, feeling of self-identity and authenticity? So here are some steps. First of all, we just want to promote healthy risk taking. So, for example, trying out for a sports team, that's healthy risk taking, right? Doing something that feels a little bit uncomfortable. My good, you know, if, if I have so many, anxiety is such a barrier for so many kids. And they won't attempt something because they think they're going to mess up or they're going to fail or everyone's going to, you know, remember it forever. And that the thing about that type of avoidance is that all it does is create more avoidance in the future. I always tell kids the number one thing that anxiety wants you to do 
is avoid the thing that's causing anxiety. So the more you avoid, the more the anxiety builds, and it just kind of is like a snowball effect. The only way to, get to, to move through that is to go through it. Can't go over it, can't go around it, have to go through it. And so healthy risk-taking chips away at that anxiety and builds that confidence. I can try this, I can do this, I can speak in front of the class. I can ask a question. I can try out for the sports team or the play. Encouraging that open communication, we've talked about that a little bit already, but just really offering those opportunities to try to get some, some feedback from them. Um, and also, I think the other part of that is like not jumping in and trying to solve the problem. You know, I think sometimes we talk about this in relationships but with adults, but it's the same with kids. It's like, do you want me to listen or do you want me to help you find a solution? Because those are two separate conversations that we're having. If you just want me to listen, that's fine. Vent all you want. But I think as parents, we try to jump into problem solving mode sometimes too quickly, but what that ends up doing is shutting kids down. Then they don't want to talk because we feel like we're just trying to fix it for them. Just developing those problem solving skills. So along with that open communication, how are we having this conversation? How are we encouraging them? Like, what do you think you could do? You're anxious about giving this presentation in class. Are there any other solutions that you could do? Could you talk to your teacher about doing it one-on-one? -on -one? Could you practice and, and build up your confidence, maybe with a couple of friends? Maybe you could record yourself and watch it first. Like, what, how could we solve this problem? And helping them really try to brainstorm what those might be. This is an area where it's like, if they aren't really coming up with some ideas, I'll tell you what I love to do, actually, with my clients, is I'll hop on ChatGPT with my clients and say, what should a student do if they're struggling with this type of situation? ChatGPT will say things that are the same things I would say, but it's not me, <laughs> and these are even my clients, but, but just that triangulation, it really kind of puts the power back in the kids' hands, right? Because this is just this machine that's saying these things, and then I get to choose what I'm going to do there, as opposed to me suggesting something which then might be tied up with a whole bunch of other implications as far as what I expect, what my expectations are. When we do it that way, it takes my expectations out of it. And so that can really build that autonomy. Create realistic expectations and goals. What is a realistic expectation for grades or for where you're going to go to college? Um, man, I can't tell you how many heartbroken kids I've had who are just brilliant. And they apply to all of these really highly selective colleges. And then they only get into the, like, their safety school. And, you know, <laughs> trying to help kids understand, it's like, Applying to college in a lot of ways, I feel like it's like a lottery, you know? It's like it's so hard to really know what they're looking for, and these highly selective colleges accept so few kids. It's not about you, <laughs> but that it doesn't feel that way in that moment. And then really allowing that authenticity. So I want to talk a little bit about camouflaging and masking and related to that authenticity piece. So neurodivergent people in general often find that they feel like they have to mask or camouflage their, their neurodivergent characteristics. The gifted, kids, the gifted kid has to hide their ability. The ADHD kid develops um, perfectionism to mask their areas of difficulty, um, you know, where they, where they make mistakes on their tests, and so they go over it and over it and over it. Um, the autistic kid ends up mimicking what they see other people doing as far as social relationships goes because they think it's going to help them build friendships, but then it doesn't work the way they expect, and that's kind of confusing. So when I talk to kids about allowing that authenticity, I want to value the fact that there is a point to all of us masking or camouflaging at different points. We all have different personas that we use in a lot of different environments, and that's okay. I think the, the best thing about choosing whether or not you're going to camouflage or mask is the active choice that goes into it. So, for example, for twice exceptional kids, maybe who are gifted and autistic, one of the common stereotypical things you hear about autistic individuals is that they struggle to make eye contact, right? That it's really uncomfortable for them to make eye contact when they're communicating with somebody. So they might prefer to look at the floor. So sometimes what's common practice is that we teach autistic kids, okay, well, 
if, if somebody is, you know, if you're talking to somebody, you don't have to make eye contact, but you could look at like their chin or their ear or their forehead or something. So basically you're faking making eye contact and they think you're making eye contact. Um, but sometimes that also just causes more stress because then I'm sitting there thinking, okay, how long have I been staring at their forehead? Okay, now I need to look, <laughs> look away. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's going on with that. So weighing out the benefits and the drawbacks for certain situations is really important. So there might be some situations where it's safe for me to unmask and to say, you know what, I just want you to know that even when I'm not making eye contact with you, um, it's because I have a really hard time focusing when I am making eye contact. And it's much easier for me to listen to you when I'm looking at the floor, right? The benefits might outweigh the drawbacks in that situation. There might be other situations where it feels safer or the benefits to go ahead and mask. I am going to fake it in this situation for whatever reason. You know, I'm not ready to disclose that or to advocate for that in that moment. And so we want kids to be empowered to make those choices. So this acronym, the TRUE acronym, talks about steps that we can help kids take in order to really decide whether or not they want to mask um, or be authentic in those situations. So the first one is like, if they're in a situation, we want them to trust their feelings right? Do you, how comfortable do you feel in a situation? If you feel kind of, I don't know that I really love the word unsafe in this context, but I guess that's the word that I'm going to use, but like um, uncertain maybe is a better word. If you feel uncertain about how you're being perceived, or if you feel like maybe people aren't really, aren't really open to seeing the true you, you have to kind of trust that. You also have to trust the feeling whether or not, like if you feel like you're being really fake or inauthentic, right? So you want to trust those feelings. You want to reflect on that masking, and that's the benefits and the drawbacks piece, right? I'm going into this class, and I'm not raising my hand because I don't want people to think that I'm the teacher's pet, but also I have some, I have some good ideas that I want to get the teacher's feedback on. How do I... You know, what's the benefits and the drawbacks on masking in that situation? Understanding your needs. So what works for me? What do I really need? How much of that discomfort can I tolerate in certain situations? And then finally, just kind of experimenting with it, right? The nice thing about being a tween and a teen is that you don't have to totally know who you are yet. You can kind of play around with it a little bit. That's part, of the, that's part of that identity development that we know that kids really experience. So I have some, I'm gonna close out by sharing with you some really useful apps that I use with a lot of my clients for a variety of different things, but specifically kind of for some of that um, mental health type stuff. So for this first one, um, the website there is One Mind Cyber Guide, but cyber is spelt P-S-Y. OneMindCyberGuide.org, um, and this is a great tool if you're just looking for some apps or some different tools that might be really useful for, for students or your kids. Um, it's basically like consumer reports, but for mental health type apps. And so it tells you all sorts of things such as, um, you know, what are the privacy policies, who is creating this, and so I would highly recommend if you're looking for a tool, this would be a good place to go. Oh, I, I guess I have a little video here. I forgot that, that this was a video. It'll kind of show you. So you can like scroll down. And so it kind of shows you all the different needs that you might have. So sleep, stress and anxiety, find stress and anxiety apps. And then you can scroll down to all of these different pieces here, and it gives you some suggestions. You can filter all of the different needs. It tells you what the credibility is. Transparency is talking about the privacy piece. Um, and then you can look and kind of scroll through and kind of see what it's all about. Um, also, these are... Um, specifically reviewed by actual mental health clinicians as well. So that's where that review piece is coming from. So you can get some good feedback about it. 
So I would really recommend this if you're looking for, for a tool. One of the things I love about this is like it kind of gamifies, not, not this particularly, but some of these apps really kind of gamify some of the strategies and skills we want kids to learn. And let's be honest, most of them are on their technology all the time anyway. So um, here's another app. This app is called Dailyo. If you notice, the, the name of it is kind of right up there. Um, so Dailyo is a mood tracking app. I love using this app. I use it with a lot of my kids for a lot of different reasons because basically it gives you a little notification, those little emojis up there at the top, and you just click one and then it brings you to this page where then you can tailor all of this. It can be whatever you want it to be, but you select what, what options you want it to monitor and then you're like, okay, what was I doing today? Um, what was the weather like? I was actually tracking it because I get migraines and the weather impacts my migraines. Um, and so, you know, what did I do? What did I do for self-care? Blah, blah, blah. And then you can just kind of click it. But then, so it gives you a, a, um, a printout of this, but then it tells you all of this data. How many days did I have a particular mood? How many activities have I done that have been counted in different times? Look at this. My, my best average daily mood was on Fridays. Shocking. And so you can see all of this information. And the cool thing is you can actually then share this. So when I have clients do this, I have them, they can just share it to me specifically, and then I can look at it. We have a little bit of accountability there. But the nice thing about this is that um, um, you can make it for a lot of different things. So for example, if you just want to track your mood related to how you felt at school that day, right, about school anxiety or something, you can make it whatever you want. You can track your mood in any different way, and it's really um, customizable. And so I really like this, this app. I think it's also really good. Um, the thing I notice about a lot of my clients is that they really like the data collection piece of it and kind of then going back and looking for those patterns. Um, as far as like calendars and things go for executive functioning, I think that the biggest thing to realize is like there are a million of them out there and kids will say they don't work for me. And my response is always like, well, let's try a different one. <laughs> There are so many out there that we can really kind of get some um, different opportunities to kind of figure out what works and what doesn't. But I think, especially for kids who struggle with time management, having something like this that helps with the time blocks can be really useful if they can start to kind of build some of those time estimation skills. So this app is called Habitica, and I think this one's a video here too. So Habitica is a great little gamified, it's kind of like a little role play game, um, but what it does is like you decide what habits you want to build and then you earn points and gems or different things for it um, that can kind of help you. And so it kind of guides you through this. But again, it's just gamifying this task of being able to build this. Um, and I know kids, it's like, I don't know, it's just got those funky little, little um, avatars for the characters and everything. And it kind of walks you through it. Um, so you can make whatever the task is specifically. But this is a fun one for kids who really just need some, some um, motivation to try to do some things, but also opportunity, like it, it gives them a little bit more of a structure. Finch is a good one for mental health and stress. So Finch is an app that has this little bird. <laughs> and as you go through and you do um, things that are good for self-care and mental health, it, you earn points, and when you get points, I don't know, I guess it's called vibes or whatever, you, your finch grows from a little egg up to a bigger bird <laughs> finch, and you can buy clothes and all these different things, but it really prompts you, so it's like you'll notice like morning stretches or reflection or dream diet, like all these different really structured coping skills that are really cool. Forest is an app that is um, really good for time management and task management specifically. So if you have kids who get distracted by their technology, what this app does is it helps you to build a forest, but it locks down your phone. So this is set right now where it's going to lock down your phone for 25 minutes. That's what that 25 there represents. And so when you start it, if you, if you go the full 25 minutes, that little tree goes into your forest and it grows. If you don't, then it, then it dies. 
it's very sad. But you can also collaborate with your friends. If you have this, you can connect and then you can have like shared study time. And if you both have your trees grow, then it helps everyone's forest grow. Um, and so this is, but, but basically the nice thing is though, if you open up another app or you close this app out, then you haven't fulfilled whatever that task is. So it can help to just kind of like have that put aside there. Here's my Duolingo thing up at the top. And then these are some books that I just recommend that are really great um, as far as helping kids. So Slaying Digital Dragons, if you have a kid who has kind of a little bit of a tech addiction, this is a really good one that they can read through and it gives them some good tools. Um, Adulting Made Easy is great. I actually give this to all of my clients when they graduate from high school, um, but just that high school age, early, you know, late, late teens, early 20s. The Executive Functioning Workbook for Teens, um, is great for just building those executive functioning skills, the Gifted Teen Survival Guide, and then the Spectrum Girls Survivor, Survival Guide, um, specifically for autistic kids. So um, I would recommend all of these. And then as we wrap up, we will do our drawing here. So I need to find my phone real quickly, and we will see who our big winners are. I did forget to set this up, so you're going to have to give me just literally like 30 seconds. It won't take me long, but I just have to link it up. Um, ch -ch -ch -ch. Link to Google Spreadsheet. It's amazing what technology can do, especially if you have it set up beforehand and you don't have to sit here and do it right now. Um, okay. Well, this is going to be very anticlimactic if it's not going to work. Um, I suspect that it went to a, to a different tab than what it was supposed to. Okay, I have bad news. I'm sorry. I messed up. I must have messed up on one of the forms because when I pull up the Paradise Valley one, there's no names on it. So either nobody signed up, in which case nobody wins, or... <laughs> Or I messed up, but I'm not going to have you guys sit here and wait for me to try to go through and like mess around with the spreadsheet. So we will draw the names, and then um, Karen and I will work together to get them to you. But anyway, I appreciate your time. Um, if you have any other questions, you're welcome to hang out, and, and I'll be here for a little bit to answer those. Thank you so much.